brother. And I get the privilege of moderating this distinguished panel. We have two great panelists. The topic is innovative solution to providing reliable power. And we're going to have a, a short video presentation and presentations by both our presenters. Um, the first will be Eric Tuminen. He's the Managing Director of Government Relations at APR Energy. Uh, since 2004, he has fostered APR's energy business development and public policy efforts. And then secondly is Ken Ditzel. He's the Managing Director at FTI Consulting and is based here in Washington, D.C. He's in the Network Industry Strategy Practice and the uh, Economic Account Consulting segment of uh, FTI. He's an expert advisor uh, on coal, oil, gas, power generation, biofuels, and manufacturing industries, if I've got that right. So without further ado, Eric, you want us to run the video, is that correct? Yes, please. Okay. Let's start the video. Economies can't grow in the dark. It has been estimated that electricity shortages cost the global economy more than a half of a trillion dollars each year in lost GDP. These shortages exist in both emerging and developed markets and have a fundamental impact on economic growth, political stability, health, education, and overall quality of life. In fact, almost 20% of the world's population has no access to electricity at all. The causes of these power shortages are driven by a number of factors. Lack of investment and aging infrastructure, rapid development and urbanization, decommissioning of outdated power plants, natural and man-made events, and changing weather patterns. But building a new power plant typically takes three to five years, and due to severe lack of funding, many new projects cannot even break ground. That's why new power plant construction in some parts of the world is at an all-time low. However, thanks to mobile technology and advancements in plant design, there is a solution that helps cities, industries, and economies get the power they need quickly. With APR Energy's fast-track mobile power plants, entire cities are powered within days, not years. APR Energy combines speed, scale, and technology to build turnkey power plants that are tailored to each customer's requirements. Through our strategic alliance with GE, APR Energy uses the latest mobile turbine technology available. This turbine technology is used in many permanent plants around the world and relied upon by some of the most well-known and dependable aircraft in service today. APR Energy's power plants can operate either on an interim or semi-permanent basis and can deliver incremental electrical capacity equivalent to a traditional power plant. These power plants are flexible enough to integrate into permanent infrastructure and provide grid stability to regions as remote as the Sahara Desert or deliver urgent emergency power following a natural disaster. Most importantly, because APR Energy builds, owns, operates, and maintains its plants, customers do not need to worry about upfront funding or financing. They simply pay for power. Following our purchase of GE's turbine rental business, APR Energy is now the world's largest supplier of fast-track mobile turbine power. With over 2.5 gigawatts of projects executed in more than 25 countries around the globe, APR Energy is a company customers trust to deliver power fast when and where it is needed. The reliable electricity we provide powers millions of homes, helps industry grow, and improves people's lives. We help keep the lights on because economies can't grow in the dark. APR Energy, powering your progress. Learn more about APR Energy and our mobile fast track power solutions at APRenergy.com. Thank you. Well, we all recognize that electricity is a fundamental building block to the societies. We don't need to go back over the statistics that we've all heard today. Um, my remarks in the context of innovative solutions for delivering reliable power will focus on new ways of thinking 
about the satisfying these underserved markets and showing how fast electricity can now be delivered to millions of underserved people at a time. We look back to Sri Lanka first, 2001. The country was emerging from civil war. Shortly following the peace accords, we delivered a 20 megawatt plant in 60 days to Jatna. During our first visits there, our CEO likes to tell the story of the fishermen who are selling fish by the, on the beach, a few fish at a time, no way to keep them fresh. A few months after we turned the power plant on, the fishermen were selling a day's catch at a time on a bit of ice. They plugged in an ice machine. And yet later on in the process, while the plant was running, a restaurant was open on the beach. So these are the kind of transformative events that happen on a day-to-day -day basis once you can provide power to the underserved markets. The same story can be told today and is being written today as we speak in Myanmar, a country emerging from economic isolation, where earlier this year we installed a 100 megawatt power plant. Today, about 6 million people in Myanmar have electricity as a result of that fast track solution. Now jumping to another continent, Senegal, 2011, Senegal was experiencing power outages of increasing frequency and severity. The IMF reported that year that the energy sector had emerged as a bottleneck to growth, and due to the gravity of the, the, due to the capacity constraints and frequency of electricity outages, lack of electricity was reducing real GDP growth by more than 1% per year. Aggregated across the economy, that's a very big number. These power outages eventually triggered episodes of violence and rioting, some of which targeted the electric utility and its assets. This would have had the potential to be a very messy situation because the country was moving into an election year. So the government implemented an emergency electricity program. There was an international tender, and APR Energy was awarded a contract for a 50 megawatt plant that we installed and commissioned in 60 days. We were subsequently awarded two more tranches of 50 megawatts each, bringing up our capacity to 150 megawatts in that country. The incumbent lost the election, but the transition was peaceful and the democratic process was able to run its course. And in June 2013, the IMF was able to report that Senegal's economic activity had picked up in 2012, and despite the unfavorable external environment, the outlook was positive. So what we've seen here are some examples of APR Energy's implementation of a typical fast-track solution in response to a number of different circumstances that we encounter around the globe post-conflict situation in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, an emerging economy trying to become competitive on the world stage, and in Senegal, accelerating electricity demand, outpacing the rate of power sector investment and maintenance. In all of these situations, waiting three to five years for a fix is not a viable option. When a crisis strikes, power is needed immediately. The fast track solutions we described above were typically based on the use of power modules. These operate on diesel fuel, or in the case of Myanmar, on natural gas. APR's power modules are made by Caterpillar, which are built into a 20-foot shipping container and provide about one and a half megawatts of power each. The plants are extremely mobile, they're flexible, they can go wherever a truck can go, and they're easy to operate and scalable, but up to a point, because of a relatively small power supply for, for the footprint, large amounts of power need a very large area. The world of fast track power took a big leap, though, in 2011, when Japan uh, suffered the uh, tsunami and earthquake and the Fukushima nuclear plant was damaged. Power needs for rebuilding and to safeguard the nuclear facility were immediate and they were massive. This is where APR's turbine technology came into play. We installed over 200 megawatts in 45 days, almost half of that based on turbine technology. The turbine technology, as Brian explained earlier, is a compact, trailerized system. It's a jet engine built inside a truck, configured to be shipped by land, air, or sea anywhere in the world for quick installation. These plants are capable of delivering approximately 20 times more power per unit size in comparison to the diesel power module. Multiple units can be installed on a given site to provide power capacity measured in hundreds of megawatts. The turbine is also a dual fuel product, meaning is capable of operating on and seamlessly switching from liquid fuels to gas fuels. With about 30 megawatts of capacity, a single turbine is the equivalent of power consumed by about 30,000 homes in the US. In a developing country like Myanmar, one 30 megawatt unit 
can easily satisfy the power requirements of more than one million people. Imagine parking four tractor trailers side by side and almost overnight sending electricity to the grid for four million people. A very transformative effect. Turbine is also a sustainable solution. Many utilities around the world already own and operate permanent power plants based on turbines for their peak base load and peaking plants. And in fact, one of the um, episodes in the video showed um, our um, installation in Uruguay where the permanent installation is almost indistinguishable from the temper installation. These are also relatively quiet and clean power plants, particularly when operated with water injection or natural gas fuel. One of our recent projects in Martinique uh, involved the installation of a turbine in the center of Fort France, a tourist destination. And the turbine was able to meet the very stringent environmental and noise level constraints enforced by the local authorities. Today, with the mobile turbine technology, power can be delivered quickly, and it can be delivered in very large increments. Through our strategic partnership with GE, which we announced last year in October, APR now has access to the most reliable turbine technology in the world, the TM2500. In Libya, in 2013, we installed over 500 megawatts of power in about 130 days, and a substantial part of that capacity is turbine technology. In Uruguay, we installed 100 megawatts, and subsequently scaled that up to 300 megawatts. For the first time in 15 years, Uruguay is now energy independent. And in Angola, in June of this year, we added 40 megawatts of turbines to our existing plant, doubling in our capacity in that country uh, in about 60 days. Uh, this was our first installation of a turbine in Sub-Saharan Africa. But this isn't just about technology. As we've seen from earlier presentations, there are many obstacles to scaling up a country's electricity installed capacity. These include financing obstacles, these include know-how and technological uh, skills. What allows us to move so quickly is that we bundle a full-service turnkey solution into a very simple contract approach with very straightforward risk and, uh, and responsibility allocations. So we don't need an army of lawyers to negotiate a contract. This can be done in a few days with a small team. Simply put, the customer provides us with a site, with an interconnection to the grid, and a fuel supply. And we do everything else. We purchase the equipment, we transport it, we have all of the installation and operation under our responsibility, and we also hire and train the local workforce to provide the bulk of manpower for the operation. So the customer gets what is needed, electricity that is 100% reliable because we sell the kilowatt hours, not equipment. And we stand behind the contracted installed capacity and the delivery schedule and availability. We know of many, many developing countries that have become graveyards for modern technology that was never operated or maintained properly. This sets aside that, that element of risk. And when the power is no longer needed, we can demobilize and we can move the plant elsewhere. Uh, one last point, the mobility of the equipment allows us to address also transmission bottlenecks because we can move the power plants to, where the, to multiple locations strategically located near the power loads. So to summarize, at APR, we are acutely aware of the need for urgent solutions. We have for more than 10 years demonstrated our commitment to changing people's lives by providing turkey power plants to alleviate power crises brought on by a host of different factors, be they drought, lack of investment, natural disasters, consequences of conflict. We take a different approach for the fully self-contained solution to provide a bridge so governments can plan and implement long-term strategies without the threat of civil unrest and economic stagnation. Thank you very much. Eric, great comments, and you've got quite a product. With that, let me turn it over to Ken. All right. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> Thanks. Just one moment. We're looking for slides. Hold on. Yeah. Give us the high sign when we're ready. Here we go. Something. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about natural gas today, mostly from a domestic U.S. perspective. And you might ask, well, what does natural gas have to do with uh, electricity supply and technology that we're supposed to be discussing on this panel? It's clearly a lot. If you take a look at 2001, about 60% of U.S. electricity was generated from coal. Uh, that has now moved down to 50%. Uh, gas was at 10% in 2001. It is now at 20% now. So it's quite a huge change. A lot of that's been driven by gas prices and also regulations that have, uh, have uh, furthered that change. 
and we expect that going forward. So DAS is going to be important in terms of technology selection. It's going to be setting the bar for what technologies you choose going forward. So giving a perspective on how gas markets might form and how gas prices might look going forward is important. So there's really three interconnected objectives for delivering electricity globally. Uh, people want their electricity to be reliable, so when you go flip the switch, it's on. Uh, they want it to be cheap uh, and increasingly sustainable. Uh, reliability is always number one. Uh, historically, cost has been number two. Uh, it's becoming more and more fact that sustainability and low cost are becoming equivalent in terms of a second place, uh, given where EPA is uh, placing some of its regulations. With, uh, with the numerous EPA regulations that have come out, they're taking, taking uh, effect soon, particularly the mercury and air toxic standard. Uh, we expect coal to diminish, it's an obvious statement. Uh, but gas is going to be there to shoulder much of the burden going forward in terms of reliability and delivering low cost. If you just take a look on the left hand side of this chart, you'll see that we have the MAT standard in 316, which is the cooling water standards that are going to affect some retirements of coal, possibly 20% of the fleet by 2017. And then we have a number of proposed regulations. The most um, highlighted one coming out this summer is the EPA Clean Power Plan which targets CO2 levels that will be 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. And then another number of other uh, of plans as well. I'm not exactly sure what the pointer is here, but on the chart you'll see that natural gas combined cycle is on the, on the left-hand side, and that's about $4.50 per million BTU going into that price point, delivering around $51, $52 per million BTU on a levelized cost basis, so that's including all the capital and O&M now you take out coal, and what becomes interesting is what, what really becomes the backup. Coal was there as a diversity um, uh, fuel source for a lot of generators, and now it's slowly being taken away. And so then you have wind, solar PV is really the immediate backups. Well, they're intermittent, right? They're not baseload backups. You need electricity storage in order to enable those. Well, then that affects the cost. And if we go back to that three figures that we had in reliability cost and sustainability, uh, you have to factor that in too. So you would say, well, there's nuclear. And nuclear takes about at least 10 years in terms of planning cycle from concept to actually uh, going into operation. So uh, with uh, natural gas being the lead fuel going forward, the diversity change with coal being taken out of the mix, you have wind and solar as the backup primarily. Uh, that's something that really needs to be taken into consideration. No matter which way you look at it, predicting future natural I'm sorry. I'm hitting the button, but there it goes. Got it? Okay. Predicting future gas prices obviously has been challenging. Take a look at the EIA reference cases for the annual energy outlooks, and just going forward, looking at the singular case, the reference case, they rarely hit their targets. So we all know that gas prices are volatile and often our prediction is wrong. The other thing to take away from this chart is that we, we tend to take a look at where prices are today and then we just move them forward a little bit. So we're, we have this bias of being where we are seated today and we, we forget to take a look at some of the fundamental drivers that are out there that really could change the marketplace. Can you flip the slide please? <coughs> and I'm just gonna run through a couple slides. Take a look at AEO 2008. See here in the orange, this is the forecasted range by EIA. That was their high and low going forward. Completely missed it. Um, uh, as, as we know what happened, shale gas transpired, prices declined rapidly, and uh, they, they came well below the forecasted range. Next slide, please. We shifted to 2010, and a similar phenomenon. We're still catching up with, the, with shale. We're kind of biased towards where prices are at that point in time. And again, we're well above where gas prices ended up today. And then we move to the latest ADO. Next slide, please. And we see again, we're, we're kind of starting from where we are today. We have a very narrow, very narrow range going forward, and that starts to spread going out past uh, 2025. So next 
Next slide. I think it's it's important to remember that picking the scenarios is is critical. It's key in terms of understanding where gas prices might be going uh, in the future, and understanding the fundamental drivers between what would drive prices low and what would drive prices high is critical for utilities when they're selecting the technologies that are going to be part of, part of a portfolio. And this just puts the, some things in perspective. Uh, there's a number of international drivers out there that could actually end up affecting domestic prices, and uh, the one that's most important is LNG. Uh, we haven't begun LNG exports yet. Beginning in 2016, we, ex we expect the Sabine Pass facility to start operating. A number of other facilities are in the queue uh, and, and in advanced planning stages, but Sabine is the only one that is actually under construction. It is possible that if all these facilities that are in kind of the advanced planning stages come to fruition, we would see maybe 8 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas uh, exports. And that's a little over 10% of the current demand that we see in, in the U.S. And as long as the, the differential remains there between LNG export prices, so if you look at the purple line, you see the Japanese LNG import price and the domestic price, it's really going to be driving these LNG export plants to come on. You need a spread of at least $6. $6 covers the cost of shipping liquefaction in order to get the Henry Hub price over to Japan. So if you add uh, six bucks roughly to the four dollars that you see on the green line there, you're, you're at about ten dollars. You still have about a five dollar cushion, or sorry, a five to seven dollar cushion uh, for delivered LNG into Japan. <coughs> Next slide. Please. This slide just helps kind of frame the scenarios. The last slide looked at well, what could be a potential high? Right? We have the LNG exports driving net back prices here in the U.S. Well, there's a lot of uh, drivers that could keep LNG prices low, and we're sitting in the most current situation with oil prices declining rapidly. A lot of LNG is indexed to oil, and so we expect uh, delivered LNG prices to start to decline. But there are factors other than that that would drive LNG prices lower internationally and also keep prices in the U.S. low. And those are flat GDP uh, or growth globally or low growth. We could also see a boom in shale gas. Uh, there's been a lot of efforts in China and Poland to develop the shale gas industry. Uh, it's been slow, uh, but it could take off in the next 10, 10 or so years. We could start to see pressure from the LNG buyers to move away from the oil linkage so that we get a, a market that's uh, more free in terms of how prices are determined. Uh, Jap Japan uh, restarting its nuclear fleet could have an enormous impact on, on LNG demand, decreasing the demand that is currently in the country due to Fukushima. And we could see Germany, which I think is very unlikely, abandon its plans to retire its nuclear fleet. Those are the kind of factors that could drive prices low. And, and what we're seeing in terms of what I tell clients is that you could see prices as low as three to four dollars per million BTU going forward, uh, or as high as eight, eight, eight dollars per million BTU going forward to 2020, 2025. So it's a, it's a broad range, it's much higher than what EIA predicts, but what we've done is take a look at the fundamental drivers that would get you here. So next slide, please. So in the context of technology, what are kind of the options for mitigating some of the forecasting bias that we use in technology selection and, and also the price uncertainty? Well, I think it's going to be key as we start moving towards a more uh, natural gas focused economy, electricity economy, and we need to build out the infrastructure to deliver the gas. And we saw that last year with the polar vortex and when we have prices getting to $8 per million BTU, some of the city gate prices getting up to $100 per million BTU. We need the infrastructure to enhance the reliability and promote the diversity of other generating uh, resources. Uh, also, uh, more and more gas purchasers are starting considering uh, uh, options that are kind of out of the box thinking in, in terms of mitigating gas price risk. And it's not just taking NYMEX positions, but it's actually entering into long and, and medium term fuel purchasing contracts with gas producers. This is done all the time on the coal side. So we would ex expect see more of this to kind of push in uh, the impact, but, but, but generators actually buying the gas straight from the developers or from a marketer uh, would be something that we would consider 
a, a, a terrific mitigating strategy. Also taking equity positions in some of the gas producers to profit from when the gas prices are higher. Entering and tolling agreements as well could also remove fuel price risk. Uh, on the technology side, we have supply and demand, uh, investing in renewable and, and renewable enabling technologies such as storage can help with mitigating uh, gas prices. This is why you see companies like Southern uh, not only investing in gas, but a lot in solar, because they understand the fact that gas prices could rise. We're kind of closer to the bottom range of where gas prices would be, with the potential being much higher for gas prices to rise. How do you mitigate that? Well, you go to sources that that have zero cost for fuel, and that's wind and solar. Also investing in energy efficiency and demand side response technologies also can kind of help mitigate the commodity risk. So that um, finalizes my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. Ken, thanks. Um, you're, you're, I'm impressed by your product and where you've taken it, your successes. Where you go, uh, is it not dependent on the infrastructure that's there to transmit the power that you make. In other words, that's, do you have anything to do with the other infrastructure that's in place in the undeveloped countries you're going to? We are typically just are providing the generation capacity, but by the nature of the generating capacity, the fact that it's modular, it's mobile, we can actually jump, install our capacity in various parts of the country to address those transmission issues while they build out their, their transmission uh, grids. We do not build transmission grids ourselves. We don't address that particular aspect. But we can address the, the consequences of not having a, a reliable grid by putting the generation where the loads are. I presume the majority of the power that you're selling yourself is sold to government entities and not to private. Typically, we, uh, we sell into a, a national grid or into a national utility. Uh, we have and we can sell into a, um, an industrial facility, for example, as, a, as an ISO. And, and the reason I ask is that yeah. you know, we've all traveled worldwide and seen countries where you go in and there's just wires everywhere and people stealing electricity yes. or subsidies, government subsidies left and right. How do either one of those impact your ability to sell your product? We are typically paid for the electricity we deliver directly to, to the customer. So, but ultimately, the customer's ability to collect from his, his uh, the utility's ability to collect from their customers affects their credit worthiness and their ability to finance long-term investments. So those kinds of situations in a way drives the demand for our product because it means that the investment doesn't follow because the utility is not managed for them. And then the, my last question is more of a more of curiosity and technical question than anything else. But as I understand it, you go and you sell the power. They don't pay for any of the infrastructure or that you're your trailers and that kind of stuff. You're selling, well, you're making a profit by selling the power. They pay by kilowatt hour. That's exactly what you pay. So your standard, you don't have to divulge it if you want to, but what would be your standard contract? How long would that last to make it profitable? In other words, would you sign it and say, you've got to buy my power for a year or two years, or is there a time limit? or is it There really isn't a time limit. I, I mean, I, I think it's hard for us to do contracts less than six months. It's because you have logistics costs involved. Sure, sure. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of say, underlying costs that have to be absorbed in the contract, in, in the actual sale of kilowatt hours. So it's hard for us to look at less than six months, although I think we're probably not five months. <coughs> After that, it's three years, five years. The sky's the limit, particularly with the turbines. We can run the turbines for 20 years, in theory. Is it, is the well, really, last question is the cost on a sliding scale. In other words, the longer uh, they use your power, is the cost per kilowatt hour decrease? That, that certainly helps uh, bring the cost down. Yes, if we can lock in a longer term contract, the, um, then then we can we can be much more uh, much more flexible on the price. I think one of the issues we run into with many of the utilities is they have budgeting. It's on an annual basis, so they have trouble committing to a three or five year term, even though they know they'll need it. And in a way, it hurts them because we, we could probably give them better terms if we could already lock in. But often we're, we're stuck with a really budgeting cycle. It's just fascinating what you're doing. I'm impressed. Uh, Ken, here at ASP, we've talked a lot about impacts on national security and how we prefer not to talk about bullets and bombs, but things like energy and other ways to impact our national security. And one of those has been exports of LNG. 
and particularly with what's been going on in Europe, Ukraine, and Russia, and the gas business there, of course, we've talked about Germany, and Europe's dependence on, uh, on gas from Russia in particular. You, had, you talked about Japan, and you just briefly went by Germany and its new business, but what impact does the political situation that's going on in Europe have on, on your thoughts on gas, and, and will our exports make a difference? Sure, there's a, there were a number of bills that were proposed to expedite LNG exports, uh, primarily because of the Ukraine situation. Um, but if you really step back and take a look at it, uh, delivered gas from the U.S. to the Ukraine cannot beat Russian uh, gas prices and the prices that you're seeing in Europe. So it's, it's very hard to actually move the needle in terms of energy security aspects um, from an economic standpoint. Um, I think I just saw the other day that Lithuania announced with its LNG facility that it's actually going to be paying more for the gas delivered than, than the gas that's being delivered from Russia. But it's a diversification effort. You know? I mean, some of that, that additional cost that Lithuania is taking on to them, clearly it must be worth it in order not to be 100% uh, reliable on, on Russia. Sure. Well, it's an interesting situation we've got there with LNG, certainly here. And you, you touched on the fracking business too. and price of LNG and the price of oil, and my interpretation is as it becomes cheaper and cheaper, oil and gas, then you hit a break point where fracking for gas is not profitable, and hence it stops. Would that impact the amount of LNG that's being produced here dramatically? Well, an enormous amount of the gas that is being produced in the U.S. is, is actually from gas uh, from the, the Eagle for Shale in terms of uh, the byproduct gas. And then we have a lot of dry gas in the Marcellus. Um, Marcellus is, has been phenomenal. Um, it, it, it accounts for almost 20% uh, of U.S. gas production currently. It's, it's been amazing. Um, and it's, it's risen from about a few BCF per day to about 12, 14 BCF per day currently. Um, so the, there's a lot of dry gas development going on in the U.S. that's uh, very affordable, particularly in the Marcellus. Uh, and there's a lot that's going on that, that's considered a wet gas outside the Marcellus, and that's uh, particularly in the Eagle for the byproduct gas that we see there, and some of them, and also Bakken too. Uh, and then, of course, there's a number of other shell plays, but predominantly right now they were chasing oil. A lot of the producers chasing oil, uh, and the gas was a byproduct. As oil prices declined, we're going to see um, some pullback, likely, uh, from some of the marginal wells. Uh, gas prices may rise a little bit, but there's, there's plenty of gas supply in the U.S. Well, with that, we can open up the Q&A. Uh, we do have a roving microphone. I'll, uh, if you would stick your hand in the air and I'll call on you and wait for the mic if you could identify yourself and hopefully ask a fairly short question. But we, we've got enough people in here. We can, have a, we can have a good dialogue. So I see a young man right here. Maggie, if you could. I'm Terry Hill with the Passy Pass Institute. And I'm interested whether or not anybody's really looking at the inherent uh, residual energy efficiency in the built environment in the U.S. as far as it relates to improving the security of the domestic grid. Like I would like personally like to see the, the distribution grid morph into multiple DC microgrids. And when you think in terms of really making the built environment very energy efficient to become feasible to think in terms of multiple DC microgrids. Um, and that impact on making this domestic uh, utility secure, much more secure. No, I wouldn't argue that point. I think it's a great one. I'm not sure this is APR's niche, but I'll, I'll lateral it that to over here. Yeah, no, we, we worked uh, essentially overseas on the main, main market. Uh, I would say that our distributed, the distributed nature of our generating facilities can enable smaller grids, distributed power to be uh, installed in any country, including the U.S. And this can feed into a security situation, but I think that, that's where I would stop. Kennedy talks about that. Well, I'll just say that uh, one of the things that's kind of pushing these microgrids is the, the penetration of solar PV 
across the U.S. And, and that's enabling things. And utilities are starting to get a little scared about losing load, so losing customers and losing sales. And you see uh, Arizona uh, a Public Service coming in and um, offering to customers a way for them to provide the solar power because they don't want to lose those, those customers. And I think there's a lot of inertia in the system because the, the grid is so huge and enormous and, and um, you know, we have so much coal out there and gas and we don't, we, we, a lot of our power that's generated is at the wholesale level, but, but slowly over time I think this is going to happen. I, I, I just don't see anything accelerating quickly within, a, within a, you know, the next five years. But it's going to happen over time. It's, there's no doubt that we're going to see more distributed technologies and those grids, just like what we see in the, in the, um, in the technology world with um, the iPhone and whatnot. I think we're going to see a lot of innovation going on. Sure, we hope it would happen faster, and, and I get your point, so appreciate the question. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Uh, Charles Sills, Triller Pro Construction at the Federal Allies Institute. Uh, can you mention the the at least a 10 year uh, delay lag period in the permitting or approving nuclear uh, nuclear plants, standard plants. What about your perspective on the introduction and proliferation of uh, small modular reactors uh, and, and that possible impact on the U.S. energy uh, equation? I, I can't comment too much on the, uh, the SMR plant because I mean, I know that there's been a lot of discussions around their ability to penetrate more quickly because of their size. Um, it would be fantastic if that was a true technology option that's out there that's cost effective. Um, it would be terrific for U.S. and energy security. Uh, I, I can just put an adjective to that. You probably have gone on our website. We have put out a paper at ASP on SMRs, and, and we're certainly proponents. I think the biggest problem, of course, is cost and the time to develop that nobody's put the uh, money forward to develop SMRs or to put the investment in there. And if they would, they could be. They certainly, that technology is there. You just got to get the engineering and, and do it. But it's a matter of time and money. And, uh, I just haven't seen the energy, at least on Capitol Hill or anyone else, to put the investment into it. But SMRs are certainly a part of the solution and perhaps a good one. And that's ASP has supported that. Adam. Back and then the question for each of the panelists. Uh, if the coal is more like 40 percent, the natural gas is more like 25 to 30 percent of coal's up a little bit as uh, natural gas prices went up. The question for you, Ken, is what percentage of that LNG price is actually natural gas? It's not a, the six dollars for that price above Henry Hub. If Henry Hub is at 10, it's got to be more than six dollars because you can offer It's sort of interesting to me with all the developments that's going on with the renewables and sort of combined systems that I don't see in the APR, excuse me, in your, in your various projects that have seen some renewables as part of the package without obviously giving up corporate secrets. Um, where is the renewables in your planning and development? Ken, you want to go first with the gas price? Sure. And, and I'll just comment on the, the share. You know, I looked at 2013 EIA uh, before I came over. I so, so if you take a, we take a snapshot. Right here, so oh, right. well, okay. 2014. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't look at 2014, but I just looked at the full year um, for 2013. Uh, on, on LNG prices, what is actually part of that $6? Um, about um, 2 to $3.50 is the generally the tolling price, which constitutes the repayment of the equity uh, for the liquefaction facility, uh, and the remainder being the cost of actually losing the gas or the efficiency through the process. And the pretty efficient processes now are 90 95% efficiency at a, at a liquefaction plant, so it's, it's pretty efficient. So that's, and then the rest is, is shipping. Uh, yes, regarding your question on renewables, of course we understand the benefits that renewables have in a, in a grid and going forward uh, that they will, we see them taking on a larger and larger role in, in many countries' share of electricity generation. 
our business has been founded really on, on the fast track model, on speed and 100% reliability. Because when, when we come into the picture, the customer really needs to have that very quickly and to be able to, to count on 100% on availability of the plan. Uh, renewables do not yet fit into that business model, if you like, of speed and, and reliability. Uh, so I think we, uh, I can't really speculate as to going forward, we're always looking at different ways, new ways, more innovative ways of, of meeting our customers' needs. But uh, today, it's not part of our, of our uh, fast track business model. Eric, can I piggyback on that? And just to give an example, perhaps, if you put in a, a unit in Senegal where there's a lot of sunshine, you could put solar panels on top of your unit, which would shade the unit, so you could use the power from the solar panels, and then it would shade your unit to make it more effective. I would imagine we've probably already looked at that. Well, I think, uh, I'm sure we have, uh, first of all, and I don't see it on our plants, so there, there must be a reason. Yeah, I'm sure it's not price price. But if you just look at the surface area that's needed to generate any meaningful amount of power in a solar facility, I don't know, I think you could probably get enough to cover on one of the containers to, to run the auxiliaries or the switches or the, the, the gauges or something. You're, you're really not at the point yet where in a meaningful amount of space, you can get the kind of power that you can get from a genset, let alone a turbine. We have 30 megawatts on a tractor trailer. You need how many, how many, probably hundreds of acres for, for, for solar. No, so, that's and, right. and how much time do you have? That's right. The trailer goes in overnight. Time and so, so as long as we're in that, in that, in that uh, paradigm, speed, reliability, uh, it, it, it's not, it's not yet in, in the mainstream. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Eric, what uh, the turbine, is it gas driven? Uh, what's the uh, what type of turbine? And also, how do you deal with security issues when you're in uh, one of the developing countries where you're bringing your system and there could be some conflict within the states and the country also? First, uh, your question on, on the fuel. Our turbines are an aero-derivative product, so it's an aircraft engine. They're designed to run on liquid fuels and natural gas. So they can actually switch seamlessly from one fuel to the other. So it gives a very flexible solution to the customer, particularly when there's uncertainty of supply, you plug into a natural gas supply, and then we know the situation in Nigeria, for example, where natural gas is uh, reliability is an issue. You can seamlessly switch and keep the power on while you're sorting out your gas uh, bottleneck like issues. So it is, it is, look, it's a dual fuel product. Uh, as far as security, we uh, install our plants uh, typically on a power plant site. Uh, there is a uh, normal security for any type of infrastructure of that nature, uh, with perimeter fencing, with, with whatever security is warranted by the particular circumstances. I, I think in one of your slides, there was a C-17 I saw flying in the Wild Blue Mountain, if I'm not correct. That's the turbine. It's a GE turbine. It's a GE turbine. That's what we call the PM2500. Yeah, the PM2500. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Hope Garcia from University of North Texas. Um, so this is less of a technical question and more of a community development question since you're talking about all these new um, developing areas. So is there any education that goes into educating the community on not wasting this new energy that they have. So maybe they have never had a budget, something like this before, and now I have $10 to spend on this new energy, the fish man with a freezer. Um, so he doesn't necessarily know that there's gonna be a drain on that. So to keep your business going in a community, air, a community that's never had energy before, is there any sort of education that comes from you or do you come partner with another entity to help new citizens and new community users know how to effectively use energy and then thus keep your company alive and sustainable in those new company in those new communities. Um, we are always have a, we call a community outreach, corporate social responsibility programs in the countries in which we operate. So we always work very closely with our customers and uh, in terms of what, what are their needs in terms of outreach, in terms of working with the communities. Uh, typically we've been working more in areas of healthcare, fixing schools, that type of community work, and 
less, I think, on the policy side of the utility, but certainly it's, it's an area where if we were asked to, to do that, we could certainly support our, our customers in an area such as that. It certainly would make a lot of sense. But we are very, very um, involved in our in the communities in which we work. And uh, I know in, Sh in Sri Lanka, in uh, Myanmar, we work on uh, rehabilitating the school. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, vaccination programs uh, around the world. So really very, very much involved in the communities. Sir. Last question. We we silenced you all. Uh, let me add that ASP website will carry all this tomorrow, and I encourage you to hit our energy security button on the website. It covers a lot of topics related to this, as well as climate. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. It's the end of the year. We're tax write off if you want to contribute. So, uh, contributions welcome. And I appreciate everybody coming and hanging in here today, and I really, uh, Ken and Eric, appreciate you both being here. Let's get on with it.